I'm reading from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Thanks, Anne. Good morning, everyone. I uh, spoke last week from 2 Timothy 3, and we looked at one verse in particular. And we're working our way through uh, 2 Timothy 3 for four weeks overall as this year starts to focus on the importance of the Word of God. And if you were here last week, you might remember that I hope that you uh, left the church echoing, uh, with the words echoing in your mind, all Scripture is God-breathed. And we looked at why we know that we can actually trust the Bible, why we can rely on what it has to say to us, and how we know it is actually God speaking to us, his very words. So today I hope that you leave the building with the words echoing in your mind, God's word is useful. And now that's a bigger understatement, but uh, that's where we're going today. And I'm really just looking at the second part of 2 Timothy 3.16. It's up on the screen there. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we're seeing what it means for it to be useful and looking at those four particular aspects of its uh, benefit. The concept is the idea of it's profitable to us. And as I say, that is an incredible understatement. In Job 23, Job says that I've treasured God's word more than my necessary food. So to Job, God's word is treasure. Is treasure useful? Yes. Is food beneficial? Well, yes, but not as beneficial as the word of God. Not as much as the word of God. If you have legal or medical problems, you will go to a lawyer or a doctor because they have information that will be able to help you and you pay them a lot of money for that information. Well, here in God's Word is information about your greatest concerns. How would you like it if every page in your Bible was a $100 note? That would be useful. That would be beneficial, would it not? But nowhere near as beneficial as the Word of God to us in our circumstance. Psalm 19, verse 10. The psalmist says, that the law of the Lord is more to be desired than gold, yes, even great heaps of fine gold. And he says that because there is nothing more important than understanding God's will for your life. Not only verse 15 of chapter 3 will the scriptures make you wise to salvation, which is useful, is it not? But also, here are the Maker's instructions on how we live. Life is full of difficulties. There are plenty of reefs that our boat can be wrecked on. But here is a compass, here is a map that shows us where we are in relation to everything else. It shows us how fast the tide is going against us so that we can keep some perspective on life. And it will teach us how to be Christ-like fathers, godly children, godly mothers, faithful men and women in a world where there is no uh, clear direction as to how to live. The scriptures teach us what is really important. It shows us actually how to glorify God, which is really the chief end of man and women. The scriptures will enable us to look at death and say, I fear no evil. J.C. Ryle writes, that people can, may think that they can live comfortably without the Bible, but they cannot die comfortably without the Scriptures. And verse 13 of chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, People will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
So both in life and in death, we need help, and God's word has been breathed out. He has spoken to you and I, if we but listen. So with that uh, introduction, let me pray. Lord, help us to listen to you today as you speak to us from your word. Give us open ears and soft hearts, willing to change in accordance with your will for our life. And we pray it for Christ's sake. Amen. So as I said, we're looking at four ways that God's word is a benefit to us. The first one is that it teaches us. Want to learn about God? Want to know the ruler of the universe and what he's like and what his plans and purposes are for you and for everyone else? Well, it's all in the scriptures. There's a beautiful scene in C.S. Lewis's book, uh, Narnia series. Uh, you might know it where Lucy comes up to uh, the lion, uh, the, um, uh, the Christ figure in Lewis's series. And he sees the figure there in the moonlight and uh, looking uh, larger than life and huge. And she just, in a burst of emotion, goes up and grabs him around the mane and hugs him and says, uh, Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan says, that's because you've grown, young one. And Lucy's confused because she says, it's not because you've grown, Aslan? And Aslan says, now, I do not change. But the more you grow, you, the more you will find me bigger. And it's a picture of what happens for a Christian. As we come to understand who Christ is, Jesus is very big. But the more we understand who he is, the more we understand his plan and purposes for our life, the bigger he is to us. There are some people who never grow in their understanding. They figure that they know enough about Jesus. They know the story. Sure, that's fine. What more do I need? And they are ignorant of the treasure that they forfeit. However, those who soak themselves in the word of God, those who seek to learn all they can, find knowledge that builds like a bank account. Wealth that you can draw on at any time. Wealth when you really need it. Wealth that will get you through any tight spot. God's word is useful, it's profitable for teaching. Think about it, knowledge of any kind is a blessing. We live the quality of life that we live now because we have been able to build on the knowledge of centuries of scientific development, of cultural development, of social uh, studies and, and research, economic learning, it's obvious the advantages we have because of the knowledge that we have built up over centuries. But it's not always obvious to everyone to see the advantages of the knowledge that God brings you. Nevertheless, it is there for those who seek it. So my first application today is let the word of God teach you. We become the person God wants us to be. We see the world as it really is. God's word is profitable for teaching. Secondly, it is profitable for rebuking. Why ever would you want to be rebuked? Well, I think that if I had my choice, I'd rather God rebuke me than someone else because he's a lot more gracious and a lot more forgiving and he knows my faults, and he loves me even so. You know, sometimes uh, others aren't willing to confront us with our faults. So unless we are perfect, we actually need people to help us. We need people to show us where we're wrong and point us in the right direction. And so the word of God helps us to see those faults. It rebukes us. Psalm 19, verse 11. By the law of God... Your servant is warned. And the psalmist goes on to talk about his hidden errors, his presumptuous sins, those things that you do that you don't even realize you're doing that are wrong. And he's grateful that the word of God actually points out that sort of uh, mistake. And as we study the word, that the closet is opened and everything comes under the microscope. And the psalmist is very grateful for that. And I've already quoted verse 10 to you of Psalm 19. It is more desirable than a block of flats on the Gold Coast, yea, even a waterfront block. That's the Robinson translation of Psalm 19, verse 10. So, can I encourage you to study the Scriptures? 
to be willing to listen when God points out where you're wrong. And then you'll be avoiding the dangerous mistakes that will cause you to be shipwrecked on the reefs of the sin that is in our world. And also the dangers of destroying relationships with others. I wonder, when was the last time you actually read the Bible and were rebuked by it? And a verse just jumped out at you and and you realized that there was something in your life that you really needed to get right and it just sent you to prayer. More so, when was the last time you were rebuked by the Bible and then you actually acted on it and changed your life? God's word is useful for teaching and for rebuking. And thirdly, it's useful for correcting. And the idea is that of restoration. So often we pursue agendas that are shaped by a godless society. And no wonder we, we live so poorly. We give our hearts to false treasure, false treasure. And we're surprised when our lives are not fulfilled. So God's word corrects us as well as rebuking us. He points us in the right direction through his word. One of the ways Satan loves to trap Christians is to just distract them a little bit from the main game. Do you remember the story in Pilgrim's Progress? If you haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, it's required reading, really, for every Christian. It's just a fantastic book. And there's a scene where Christian and faithful are going along the road to the celestial city, and and it's hard going. And there's this beautiful meadow right beside the road. And it's, it looks so cool and the grass is soft to walk on. And, and so Christian sees that it's, it's going alongside the road. So they discuss it with one another. We, we'll still be able to see the road. And so we, let's go into the bypass meadow and, and we'll walk there. And so they climb over the, the fence and then they're walking in the meadow. And then the meadow just takes a little bit of a turn away. But they can still see the road, so they keep in the meadow. And if you want to find out all the trouble that they got themselves into because they got off the road, you'll have to read the book. But that's what uh, Satan does. He presents us an alternative That's not quite where we should be, but it's still quite attractive and and doesn't seem to be too much of a problem, and we get seduced. The businessman, businessman, so involved with his work that he doesn't have time for his family. The wife, so involved with the kids that she doesn't have time for her husband. The single, caught up in the pursuit that they enjoy, and they just don't realise that it's actually an ungodly influence on them. It's very subtle. And so we need God's word to correct us and keep us on track to show us when we've taken our eyes off the things above. And only regular reading and praying over God's word is going to do that. So the word of God, useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and also, fourthly, for training in righteousness. In chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul uses the images of a soldier and of an athlete, and of a farmer. Let me read to you from verse 3. Paul says, Endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. And the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Then Paul says, reflect on what I'm saying so that the Lord will give you insight into this. So let's reflect on this just for a moment. All of those examples, all of those people need training. The farmer needs to know how to farm. The athlete needs to know how to be a good athlete. The soldier needs to know what he needs to do. And so there's a lot of work in learning that stuff. And then it's hard work too, each one of those. You know, you don't get to be a good athlete if you just coast along. So, I wonder, as you define your Christian life, would you define it as in training or as drifting? It's very important because... Our training is not to be an athlete, but training in righteousness. It is in training to be righteous uh, that we will fulfill the great calling that God gives us in Jesus. Of course, we aren't righteous in our own strength. It's only through the power of the Spirit and God's forgiveness in Christ that we are righteous, but we need to live that righteousness out. 
And so God has spoken so that we might do that. Now, that's not going to be easy for us to live a righteous life. So our study of the Bible must not be purely an intellectual exercise, an academic pursuit. We study the Bible so our lives might change, that we might be more righteous people. We study it so we can put into action God's commands for our life. So back to my question. Think back through this last year. Uh, As you've studied God's word, are there things you've actually acted upon? Are you a different person? We, you know, people keep talking about how this year, 2020, just gone, has been so different. Sure it has. Have you grown in Christ-likeness through all of those trials? Are you more faithful to God? Are you living for him more because you know the temporary nature of this world? Have you learned anything from this year? Has God's word taught you? Are you changing to be the person God wants you to be? He's spoken to us for a reason. The question is, are we listening? Brothers and sisters, let's not waste our time. Let us be willing to be taught and rebuked and corrected and trained in righteousness. Because that is why we are here on this earth, that we might be Christ to those round about us. Seems to me all of us would probably say that the Bible is important. Is it precious to you? Is it a treasure? Do we run to it like a defenseless soldier in the midst of the battle, desperate for a weapon to cope with what's going on in our life? When trouble comes, do we just despair? Or do we grab the sword of the Spirit, the precious instrument for one faced with great foes? Just picture it. There's the soldier. He hasn't got a weapon. He's facing the enemy, and the enemy has a sword. Do do you reach for the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to keep you safe, the shield of faith to protect you from the fiery darts of the evil one. Uh, You know, the the, the sword of God, the word of God is a two-edged sword. It will dispatch any enemy. Think about what Jesus did at the temptation. As the devil tries to tempt him at the very beginning of his ministry, what does Jesus do? He uses the word of God to decimate Satan's arguments. Well, in the long run, the only barometer, the only real measure of how precious we consider the Word of God is how often we read it. We can so easily kid ourselves. We might say that the Bible is important, but if you want to work out how important the Bible really is to you, count the number of times you read it. So my application today is simple. Whatever you do this year, read your Bible. (laughs) You may be someone who hasn't uh, read it. Um, Can I encourage you to get into it? You are in great danger of ignoring God, and God is speaking through it. There is nothing in this life that can substitute for a relationship with the living God, and he offers one. And here is all he wants you to know about himself. He will speak to you if you will but listen. So if you're not in the practice of reading your Bible... Can I encourage you to start? You may be someone who wants to read the Bible but doesn't know where to start. Well, don't delay. Just start reading one of the Gospels. That's a great place to start. Mark is a nice short Gospel. You can read it in a couple of hours. Any of the Gospels, great reading, great stories about who Jesus is and what he's on about. If you stay ignorant of the Bible, your faith will be of little value to you. As J.C. Ryle says, if your sword sits loosely in your hand, it will do you no good. Perhaps you're someone who does read the Bible but gets very little out of it. Can I encourage you to examine the methods you use? Mix it up. Change the way you read the Bible. Get some helps. Read some books that help you explain the Bible. I can give you all sorts of resources in that regard. Change it in whatever way is necessary so that you can be engaged with what is, what is being said there. And, and part of that is actually reflecting on it. It's one thing to just read the pages. It's another thing to meditate on what is really being said here. How does this affect me? Why, why, is, why is God wanting to say this to me now? And wrestle with it. Pray before you read. God answers prayer. Perhaps you're someone um, who does read the Bible regularly. Again, I encourage you to keep it up. Don't give up. 
context. Do it all the more. Listen to God speak to you. Act on what he convicts you of. It is an inexhaustible well of treasures. And uh, I have to say that time and again, uh, things in it are so relevant to my life when I read it. So let me conclude. I remember years and years ago, Anne and I were in a uh, motel in Port Macquarie. And uh, I was just drifting off to sleep. And I thought I was dreaming. I heard someone yell, help, help. And uh, I kind of woke up, and, and it wasn't a dream. It was real. Someone was yelling help. So I got up and got out into the corridor, and there was a lady who was sort of stumbling along the corridor. She was on a crutch. She was struggling, and she said, help, help. And I ran up to her, and I said, what's the problem? And she said, my, my husband's having a heart attack. So I raced into the room, and there he was on the bed. And, um, you know, I've done lots of first aid courses. <laughs> But do you think I could remember how many times to hit his chest and how many times to breathe in his mouth and all the rest of it? I, you know, I did the best I could, and I did it until the paramedics arrived, but uh, he didn't survive. So I don't know what would have happened if I'd have known my first aid better, but uh, there is a matter of eternal life and death that we need to be trained in. I know my first aid a lot better now, and I know what to do, but there are eternal matters that we need to know about. And God's word, God's treasure is here and clearly explains them. So can I encourage you to make use of the treasure? Get your Bible out, put it beside your bed, pick it up in the morning or last thing at night and read for however long time you have and ask God to speak to you through it and he will. Those who seek me will find me is the promise. Pray a simple prayer, Lord. Speak to your servant and look to see what fireworks happen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, your word is indeed useful, beneficial, treasure, a precious defense. Father, we pray that you might help us never to forget that. And as this year starts and all the other things go on that go on in our life, Help us never to neglect our relationship with you. May we hear you speak. More than that, may we be willing to obey your word and live in accordance with your will and so glorify you as we ought to the honour of your holy name. Amen.